Hello, today um, I'm joined by Professor Das, who is Professor of Early Modern Literature and Culture at the University of Oxford, Tutorial Fellow at Exeter College. Um, Professor Das's recent book, Courting India, England, Mughal India, and the Origins of Empire, has recently been awarded the British Academy Book Prize for Global Cultural Understanding. Um, Professor Das, thank you for joining us. I'm really glad to be speaking with you about, about your great book. Um, thank you. It's a pleasure. Thank you for having me. Mm, good. Um, so if I could start with a sort of broad question to begin. Um, why do you feel this is a story that needs to be told today? Um, and if you could maybe just give a brief overview of your of your text for our for our audience. Okay. So when we I'll start with a very simple question, Rahul, and I'm going to I'm afraid I'm going to put you on the spot <laughs> for this one. Sure. Um if I say British Empire, what's the first concept or idea that comes to your mind? Um exploitation. Mm -hmm. Probably. Um and I think when probably India is one of the places that comes to mind as well. Yeah, absolutely. So and that's exactly the lens we all tend to take. When we think mm -hmm. about the British Empire, we think of something that is already in situ mm -hmm. as um, a powerful presence, an exploitative presence, um, a violent colonial presence quite often. Um, but the story that Courting India tells is about 150 years before that. So mm -hmm. we're talking about um, early 17th century. This is... 1614 is technically when the story of Courting India begins. Yeah. Um, and the picture then is very different. So think of it this way. Um, an ambassador from a foreign country arrives at a thriving global economy, you know, where ambassadors from multiple different countries are present. There's trade with multiple different areas of the world going on about a quarter of the world's silver is ending up at this particular global economy. And the ambassador who arrives is from a small island, which is monolingual, uh, mono-religious largely, um, and is going through a terrible economic recession at mm -hmm. this point. Essentially, the, the crown of this country is bankrupt, pretty much. Um, that power differential is very different from what we expect. That little island, of course, is England. As my lead character, Thomas Rowe, who's the first ambassador of Eng for, from England to India, um, uh, his close friend and another kind of visitor to India at the same time, um, very idiosyncratic man called Thomas Coriat would say, Mulk Inglistan is a very, very tiny island at the edge of the world. Mm. That's how he introduced himself. He was mm. a traveler from Mulk Inglistan at the edge of the world. Um, and the global power we're talking about is the, the Mughal Empire in northern India, um, which, along with the Ottomans, the Safavids, and Ming China, essentially control most of global economy. So what interested me in the first place in terms of telling this story is precisely that sense that this is an era um, and a particular strand of the story that has largely remained untold. And yeah. that's not to say that we don't know about Roe. Um, historians of Indian history, of course, are aware of Roe's embassy. Um, he tends to crop up occasionally in the initial prefatory pages of most histories of East India Company. But the key okay. word there is initial prefatory pages. Mm -hmm. So there are two things that interested me. Firstly, the fact that this embassy is doesn't fit into our proleptic lens of power or the relationships of power. And I, I was curious about that, how the dynamics played out when they were so very different, essentially. Um, and the second was the long shadow that this embassy, despite the fact that it isn't very successful, throws across, well, basically 250 years of British rule across the world. 
after mm -hmm. this. So a lot of the preconceptions, assumptions that Roe makes, his prickliness, his um, quite stringent Protestant sense of superiority that he kind of almost wears like an armor around him, all of those tend to create a framework through which later English colonialists, adventurers, merchants, businessmen view the rest of the world, whether explicitly or in most cases, um, unconsciously. It becomes right. a part of inherited memory. Okay, I see. And just related to that point, in, in your book, you spend some time detailing Roe's career prior to India, um, his experiences in Spain, his experiences in South America. How how important are those experiences in shaping the way he acts and behaves as ambassador in, in Mughal India? But that's a lovely question. Um, it's hugely important. And partly because I think one of the things that I'm, I was particularly interested in is in the way memory works in framing cross-cultural encounters. Okay. Um. You know, I came to Oxford as an undergraduate student, um, and I still remember walking down um, the high street in Oxford on a very rainy September afternoon, looking at the buildings and thinking, I know the these because I've read about them. Mm -hmm. um, and in that sense, one of the things that I try to kind of flesh out is the way in which a new world is hardly ever new for any traveler. For Roe, his responses to India, his experience in India, and the way he responds to those experiences in India is framed by that kind of inherited knowledge. So, And by inherited, I mean right from classical literature onwards, all those tales about um, India and the Indies that have come down to 17th century English readers. Yeah. But it's also deeply implicated by English presence elsewhere. So just to give you a very small example, there's a moment in Rose's diaries where he's grumbling about the terrible gifts that he had been given to give to Jahangir, the emperor, by mm -hmm. the East India Company. So when he came, the East India Company who were em employing him gave him some things that he could hand over as gifts. Um, and it is very clear that they because many of the investors in the East India Company were also investors in the Virginia Company, right. they were going by the assumptions of what might be received well based on their new world experiences. So they were sending things like little knives, mirrors, beads. Mm. And poor Ro, you can Im imagine his embarrassment. He writes back to them saying, look, you know, there's nothing valued here except the best of the best. Right. So rather than sending me all this rubbish, just send someone to the great technological fairs in Germany and get a few curious, basically, techie gifts. Okay. Because the em emperor enjoys that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you can see why his experience in both in Europe and in the New World, in South Am America particularly, he goes on an expedition to Guyana in South America, um, would be really important in figuring mm -hmm. out exactly how this man operates on the basis right. of those experiences. Okay, that makes a lot of sense. Um, and so far we've spoken pretty much purely about, about history. Um, and I was just wondering, the um the approach you've taken in your book of contextualizing Rowe's experiences in India with the political climate that he sort of grew up in in, in England. Um, and I think you argue that that's really important to understand what he is doing in India. Um, how did you deal with that challenge of needing to be an expert in Mughal history, English history, and Europe? professor of English literature. So sort of where do you see your research profile between all of these connected but slightly different um, disciplines? Ricocheting between all of them is the short answer to that, I suppose. No, look, I mean, um, I started with a very simple question, which was precisely that. How does a cross-cultural encounter work? 
Okay. Um, and that's a deeply personal question for me. It's a personal question for a lot of us who mediate between multiple cultures, mm -hmm. nations, languages, religions, of all course. of those issues. And they are deeply pertinent questions here and now today for us. Um, and I was fairly eclectic in the sources I went to in order to find that answer. Mm -hmm. A lot of that answer, um, a lot of the parts of that answer rather, if we think of it as a jigsaw, um, lies precisely in that movement back and forth okay. um, between the two cultures, um, between the past and the present, um, and between languages. So there's a moment, for instance, in um, in Rowe's journal, where he says that um, Jahangir, the Mughal emperor, asked him to reward one of his court artists appropriately. So appropriately as in, don't reward him as if he's a servant, reward him as a prized member of my court. Right. And Jahang, um, Rose says that Jahangir calls this Mughal artist a caballero, which is a Spanish word, mm. a cavalier, essentially. Interesting. So where does that word come from in this negotiation? Is it part, is, did Jahangir really use that word? Mm. Is that Rose interpretation? Is that right. part of his own Spanish experience? Mm -hmm. That's the kind of thing that interested me. Okay. Yeah, no, that's fascinating. Um, and if, if I could ask a couple of questions, which um, try and sort of step back a, a little bit. Um, sort of, I think in the Indian media, at least, there's some interest in how... Um, a, an academic with Indian heritage at a British university such as Oxford is now writing this book about sort of the, the birth perhaps of, of the British presence in India. Um, and I, I'm just wondering if sort of when you were writing this book, you were considering your work as residing in a particular place within discourse about empire, about colonialism, um, and yeah, how, how you see that fitting into present day discussions around empire? It's an interesting question. And it won't surprise you that um, I've come across this question before mm. um, from various other sources as well. Um, I think there are two ways of looking at it. I mean, one, and this I believe in very firmly, is that as academics and as intellectuals, intellectual inquiry is not regionally delimited. Mm -hmm. In other words, um, we shouldn't be putting boundaries around who can research what yeah, and when. For sure. What does matter, however, is a question of interest and reach. In my case, I was particularly fortunate of having um, a conflation of multiple things at the same time. Um, I'm in a country where, for better or for worse, the love of sheer bureaucracy means there's a great deal of East India Company paperwork that still survives. Mm -hmm. It is, of course, a colonial legacy that we in India have also gained, right. in a sense. Um, but that makes the job of historians easier, in mm -hmm. the sense that I was in that rare place where I could essentially track Rose's experience day by day, sometimes hour by hour. Right. Um, but at the same time, um, and this is where that new development in terms of going beyond the what earlier you might have called the imperial gaze becomes important, that there is a lot of excellent, superb work in current global and cultural histories which is trying to shift that lens mm -hmm. away from the gaze that holds power. And that's what I was very keen on doing. So in, in courting India, for instance, I don't only look at Rose Journal, which is directed towards his king and to the East India Company, or indeed, I don't even simply limit myself to um, the Mughal Emperor Jahangir's Jahangir Nama. He's, despite the fact that he's one of those very rare monarchs in globally to have written something mm -hmm. himself, right. which again is a great privilege 
um, for historians to have, that you mm. can juxtapose the same day's entry quite often in Rose Journal with Jahangir's and compare the two. Mm -hmm. um, but I go beyond that and I look at Sanskrit epic poems and Marathi kind of um, text and various other things. I look at writings, letters by Dutch merchants and Portuguese diplomats, um, Jesuit priests, all kinds of people. Mm. That must so have been really that... interesting to see all of those different sources um, sort of interacting. Absolutely. I think that's the key thing for me, that um, it seems... It seems like, um, in some ways, intellectually a waste if we don't attend to all those disparate voices. Mm -hmm. um, and my intention throughout Courting India was exactly to do that, to navigate among those mm -hmm. in a way perhaps um, wouldn't be possible if I was saying that I only wanted to focus purely on English history or indeed even just history of India, pre-modern India. Mm. No, absolutely. Um, and um, sort of a, a final question about some of these broader angles. Um, I think uh, a place like Oxford has, um, it sort of has some pride in trying to be at the forefront of debate and uh, sort of taking strides forward in, in, in intellectual circles. Um, but I think for maybe those who haven't studied there, there's a sense that it's sort of a bastion of British culture and it's sort of a tra extremely traditional place and do you do you think that maybe with this book were you challenging sort of paradigms at the university in terms of how historical legacies are discussed or the way in which historical writing is done um, was that at all in your mind when you were going through your process? Um not so much in terms of Oxford itself. I mean, mm -hmm. let's face it, Oxford is strange in its combination of absolute kind of adherence to traditions. Mm -hmm. And some of those traditions go back 400 years yeah, um, or longer. And some of them are frankly very strange to those who do not belong within the closed doors of many colleges. And those mm -hmm. closed doors can look forbidding and off-putting um but the research is done by people here and now yeah by you know by people like us mm. you and me um i have lots of undergraduates here who are doing startlingly good original research mm. um and it would be an insult to them to think that they are too part of an antiquated mm. traditional space because they're not yeah, they're they're young people in their twenties and thirties who are doing absolutely cutting edge work. Mm. Um, but you asked whether I had a feeling where if what I was doing was new, um, and I hope some of it is new in the sense the way I'm approaching um, historical writing through the lens of cultural memory, okay. um, through the me lens of wider awareness of global cultural interaction mm -hmm. I think um, is unusual mm -hmm. to some extent um, and the other thing is just as we as I said before um, I was very keen on making sure that some of those things that we tend to overlook quite often when we are talking about empire we, talk, we tend to talk in very um, shall we say epic terms we talk about big right. ideas and big concepts movements mm. of nations and economies and markets mm. um, but I was equally interested in the individuals who get caught up yeah. in those waves and those individuals quite often have left very very fragmentary records of their lives mm -hmm. which are difficult to accommodate in traditional historical writing because there's only that much you can do with half a sentence about someone's life which yeah. lingers in some kind of law record in a regional mm. court. But for me, when I come across that half a sentence, which is um, by an Indian sailor requesting whether he can take his English wife back to India on the next East Indian ship, it means a lot. 
Yeah. So I try I to accommodate can... those fragments as well. Okay. No, I, I I totally agree with you. And um, what you're saying about cultural memory, I I was quite interested in. I I think you make the point that um, Roe at some point says that there's a sort of effeminacy surrounding the Mughal court, and um, at what you were saying about how assumptions seem to stay within the British colonial mind, you know, you have these ideas about sort of the effeminate Bengali and mm -hmm. lots of famous texts have been written about that by by scholars. And so I found that bit about about your book really interesting. Um, mm -hmm. So, yeah. Um, and um, if I could ask just one final thing, is there a, I know it's it's only been published this year, but is there a legacy that you would like this book to have in the next sort of five, 10, 15 and years beyond that as well? Goodness. You want me to look into the future already? Yes. Yeah. Uh, yes. Um, well, if if there is, I think it would be to encourage other scholars um, to think about this particular phenomenon that I've been trying to investigate, mm -hmm. um, which is precisely around this idea of cross-cultural encounter. Um, it is to complicate the historical narratives that we've received. Mm -hmm. um, and for particularly for younger scholars who are venturing into historical writing and historical scholarship, it's also to question those binaries, I mm -hmm. think. Um, there's, it's very tempting to fall into easy bi binaries of have and have not, power and lack of power. Um, but sometimes, as Rose's experience shows, what seems to be an assertion of power comes from a completely different place. Mm -hmm. So questioning those and digging, prodding those further, I okay. think, um, would be good to have more of. Absolutely. Okay, great. Well, thank you very much for, for taking the time. And it's been, been really interesting to read your book and to, um, to talk through it with you. So thank you. It's a pleasure. Thank you. Thanks.